I am David King, the editor and associate publisher of The Collaborative, I'm joined by Katie Husak, editor, and Stan Horchek, who is the technology editor at Popular Science. And it's sort of amazing. Um, I've you know followed your career for a while, and uh, we're acquaintances and such. <laughs> but but um, I mean, you've had such a career in magazine publishing and essentially remotely. I mean, it seems like a lot, a lot of the time you've spent working from and traveling to yeah. the center of <laughs> the publishing world. Yeah, it's weird. I, um, my current schedule, I do my, our office is on Park Avenue in New York City, uh, and I'm there roughly once a week, uh, wow. you know, now still. Uh, so I take the, the Amtrak and I've been doing that for, geez, roughly a, a little over a decade now. So like That's, for various companies. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been, it's been weird, but it's been good. You know, I, I started working in digital really early and uh, as a result, they've let me keep working in digital and, you know, just make good stuff and, you know, people keep you around. <laughs> At least that's the hope. I mean, I, I totally related to you because f- uh, I was I did it for about eight years at Gotham Gazette traveling, but I think it was maybe like twice, two, three, two or three times a month, and even that turned into like something very monumental for me when I had a child. Like it felt like separation anxiety and stuff. Right. And you have you have a family, and you. I mean, I, I just it's like it just impresses me to know that you found a way to make this work. And so I started. Um, my, my my career is a little weird because I, I started working in magazines when I when I lived in the city. I, mm. I used to I used to live in the city a long time ago. Um, the the magazines I've worked for for the past ten years I've never worked for them before. Right. Um, but when I started my career I lived in New York City. We lived um, in Manhattan for a while and then we moved out to Queens because I had a kid and living in Manhattan with a kid seems like punishment <laughs> or like crimes <laughs> I didn't commit. Um, but we moved out to Queens and it was taking me. Uh, you know, if you don't if you don't know anything about Queens, it's like imagine that the the airport is here and the prison is here and my apartment was here. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, it was taking me an hour back and forth every day. Oof. And when my daughter was born, it just got kind of weird. You know, you'd work until publishing. You don't work until five. You work right. until whenever. And then you had an, at least another hour to get home. And I was writing about tech and stuff because I worked at hilariously Maxim magazine was my first job out of college. And uh so I was going to events and stuff, and it got to be kind of a grind. Um, and then, you know, compared to what I do now, you figure I have six hours, three hours door to door to my office right. from my house, but I do it one day a week. So when I was doing in Queens, like I ended up, I end up winning in, yeah. <laughs> in yeah. this scenario. And so, t- tell us a little bit how, about how you did break into publishing and, and how you've managed. I mean, it's not an easy, <laughs> it's not, no, it's a, uh, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. I remember very specifically, I went to NYU when I was, a uh, uh, for my undergrad, I say for my undergrad as if I did any graduate work, which I didn't, <laughs> I definitely haven't. Um, but I went to NYU and I, I very specifically remember on the f- very first day of our, my intro to communications class, they were like, well, magazines aren't going to exist in 10 years and newspapers are going to be gone and all yeah. this stuff. And I was like, oh, no, like, what, what am I doing here? You know, and then um, I got an internship. Uh, <laughs> well, when I was a sophomore and I, I lied to an independent music magazine and told them that I was a junior um, because I thought that would make me more attractive. Uh, <laughs> the magazine was called Law of Inertia, which I think is now Death and Taxes, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's still kicking around. Um and I started writing reviews for them, like as a student. And I wrote a couple of cover stories in the next year, just because like it was really fun. And yeah. then, uh, so then I used that, and I got an internship at Maxim Magazine um, when I was a senior. And uh, I think I got it because, honestly, I saw that it was for digital. It was like for working on the web. This was two thousand and three, two thousand and four. So like the web wasn't as important then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I was like, sure, yeah, I'm, you know, my concentration's in digital, digital media. So I went and I really hit it off with a lot of people who work there. Um, I did my internship. It was a paying internship, Oof. if you can believe that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. What a different time. <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, then I, they, I left. I came back on a freelance basis after I graduated and I, and then I became an editorial assistant. And it was literally that entry level job where I met a ton of really smart and cool people who Mm. have given me every opportunity that I've had since then. Um, 
uh, you know, like one of the guys I worked with, John Wilde, he's like a high up editor at GQ. Um, you know, some of the editors, like the editor of Entrepreneur, I met him, you know, when I worked there. So like we were making this like dumb content, but we were like, it was the smartest group of people I ever worked with. Um, <laughs> and so like it's been just since then, like, you know, kind of just moving along <laughs> through the networks. Yeah. And has it, I mean, how much turmoil have you had to deal with? Um, I've been super lucky. Uh, when I left, when I moved back here, I quit Maxim because the, the industry was in a really weird spot. And uh, it, like a lot of other magazines, Maxim or, or Dennis Publishing or Alpha Media Group or whatever you want to call it back then, it just got sold a bunch of times, yeah. you know? And we were like, there was, it was no... <laughs> we would go into work and be like, are we going to get fired or are we going to get a bonus? Like we just didn't know. Um, and that sort of set the tone for like working in media for a really long time. And when I left there, I went to uh, an internet startup company and I, I, I launched a site for them. And then the 2008 downturn happened mm. and they were like, bye. So now <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I moved because I had this remote job working for a web startup, but now I live here and now I have to try and find a gig in media from here to work. And luckily, uh, a friend of mine had just started working at Hachette Filipaki, which is like a magazine company that still makes magazines. And he was like, we have this photography magazine and this uh, uh, like electronics magazine, and they need an editor to do stuff on the web. Can you come and do this? And I, I was like, okay, let me go interview. And I had tried to figure out like, okay, I can stay in the city for like three days a week and then I can come home on Thursday or whatever. And like this really terrible schedule that I was like willing to do. And the guy was like, well, look, the fact that you're willing to do all that suggests to me that we don't need to babysit you. So let's try it oh, wow. and see. And then it ended up being really good. And I, I ended up working for um, popular photography for like eight years until it closed two years ago. Wow. And that was really, really fun. Um, I don't know if that's an interesting story or not, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's a, it's sort of, it, it's a really, it's a weird way to work in this industry. I think, uh, I've had like a really weird path that I'm super grateful to be able to have done. And I think, uh, now you can do it a lot differently than I did, but I, I just got really lucky in a lot of ways. <laughs> Are there any trends that you've noticed in media nowadays, like in our current situation where there are these magazines and newspapers sort of dropping off and people don't really know where to go, um, where you've had this experience and, you know, and do you consider it luck that you were going into digital media and then like the web really took off? Like, do you see something similar to that nowadays that people should be jumping into? For, for content, it's really hard. I mm -hmm. mean, especially on a day like today, like we got the vice news today, like in, in the, you know, Buzzfeed laid off 200 people last week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vice is laying off 250 people this week and uh, Huffington post, you know, last week too. So like, yeah, there, it's going to be really weird for the next year is going to be really weird because there are, more opportunities, uh, but at the same time, they're going to be a lot of contract opportunities. And people who are doing freelance work, we just got like 600 really talented freelancers who are now <laughs> going to be competing for that work. Right. Uh, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it pans out. Mm -hmm. I think the, you know, there's been a lot of articles calling it the digital content bubble. I don't know how I feel about that as much as it's like a company bubble or companies where. You know, they lost some Facebook kind of messed with everybody a little bit, you know, by like making some promises that didn't exactly yeah. come true. Um, so I, I honestly, I don't know what's going to happen. Like if you ask me what the trend is right now, it's to fire everybody, right? which is bad. <laughs> um, but I think there's going to be a lot of smaller opportunities too. Mm -hmm. Like I think this idea of individuals as influencers yeah. is going to start to grow into influencers as like small companies, hmm. you know, where like the content companies are going to become like one person's going to grow to like a team of five people, you know, like I, I think that's where it has to go, where it's going to be these small clusters because it's just, it doesn't seem reasonable to be Buzzfeed anymore. Like vice having 2,500 employees, it's just, I, it seems so hard to do yeah. mm -hmm. in 2019. And so, I, I mean, I, some of the stories you do, I mean, maybe it's just because I'm a geek, but <laughs> you get to do some amazing stuff. I mean, you've been, I know you cover these technology conferences that I'm jealous of, all, all sorts <laughs> of stuff. You get, you get hands on with things that a lot of people don't get to, sure. to see for a while. What, what, what's some of your favorite 
uh, you know, things to cover and, and, and to be involved in. It's uh, it's a real weird thing. So our editor, if he, our, excuse me, our editor in chief, Joe Brown, is uh, he's a he's a really cool guy. But he he sometimes will remind you when you're being a wimp about stuff, um, and you're not asking for enough. Uh, and so last year, um, he assigned us this thing where he said, "I want everybody to take a day off and go find a story and go report it. You know, like go out, interview people, see stuff, do a thing." And uh, at the same time, Kodak was doing this thing where they were bringing back a film. I'm a big camera nerd. Um, and Kodak was bringing back this film. And I knew that the factory is in Rochester. Mm. So I was like, I bet I could go to the factory and let them take me around if I prom- like if I could get them this story. So I was like, hey, can I just come to your factory and see all your secret machines and take all these pictures? And they were like, OK, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I uh, I went out and got to like do this awesome photo essay that I've just like wanted to do forever. Um, and it turned out to be like the most successful thing I did last year, which was awesome that people were into it, you know, yeah. cause I thought like, you know, maybe this is just me being a nerd and no one's going to care about this, right. but I still would have been soaked to do it. But then it turned out that a lot of people cared about it. And I think that to me was like an important, um, sort of point for me in my career where I was like, you know what, if we just like, take stuff that we're curious about and really just nerd out about it. Like other people are probably curious about it too. Um, so that's, it's been really fun to try and explore that. Like I, I, one of the guys, I had a meeting with IMAX, the company that like makes IMAX screens. And when they did the demo, their TV had backlighting on it. Like there was like a glow coming from behind the TV. And I was like, that's cool. Is that like a IMAX thing? And he goes, no, those are $20 led strips I brought off of Amazon. I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. He's like, it's, you know, home theater guys do that all the time. It's like a trick we do. And I was like, no kidding. So I like interviewed him and I was like, oh yeah, buy this $20 thing. And like, that was one of my most successful stories of the year was just like this little tip that I learned yeah. and people were like, well, this is cool. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and like that kind of stuff, it, it amuses me to no end. Cause like I'm a super, I love seeing stuff like that. So it's been cool to, um, you know, and then there's also like, I get to play with gadgets. You, you're right. Like so a lot of times I carry around three, three cell phones at a time. And, uh, <laughs> It's very dumb. My kids are, my daughter got to get an exclusive Fortnite skin because Ooh. I got the Samsung phone early. So yeah, it's, it's definitely like a, sometimes it's stressful, but you have to take a moment and be like, this job is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. My daughter says she plays Fortnite, but she's only seen people play it in Roblox in the, like the remake. She's only five. So we're going to try to save off. Yeah, Fortnite for some time, but uh. you know, by the time she's old enough, it'll be gone. It'll be yeah. something else. Oh yeah, absolutely. something new. Yeah, not that long <laughs> of a. Everything comes and goes so quickly. Yeah, we do this thing every year called Best of What's New, mm. and um, they've been doing it for like it's like a a thing PopSci has been doing for like thirty years. So like every time we do it, there's like a lot of pressure to like make it good and make it cool. Right, and. Um, this year, one of the things we included on the list of entertainment was was Fortnite. And, like, you know, I, I think it's – if you were going to talk about the most important things in entertainment this year, Fortnite would be it because it, it was huge. It, yeah. it unified the consoles. It got millions of viewers. It, like, brought celebrity culture into, like, Twitch streamer culture. Like, those are all really culturally relevant things. But that didn't stop people from being like, you're an idiot. You ruined it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, how dare you call Fortnite – and like Don't the, talk about Fortnite. Yeah. Like you, it can only be in memes. Like that's right. the only way that it can exist. Right. Like you know. So it's a, it's one of those things that it gets a very strong reaction. And that, you know that's part of you know working at a general interest place. Like mm-hmm. can we write about Fortnite in a way that our readers are going to like? And I, I don't know. Sometimes you sometimes yes and sometimes no. So. Yeah. <laughs> so talking about film, um, obviously you're, you're a big photographer. Your work yeah. is pretty pretty. Good. Amazing, and you do nice. local gigs a, a lot too. Um, how how have you sort of? I, I, I mean, I, I believe it's something you've been doing since high school, right? I mean, you've. I actually weirdly, uh, my f- how I got into t- picture taking story is like oddly depressing <laughs> oh, because it started on nine eleven. Ah. I lived in New York City uh, when nine eleven happened, and we lived on Tenth Street uh, and Broadway, which was below the the demilitarized zone. So we had to like show our IDs to like get back to our, our dorm and stuff. If you wanted to go below 14th street and, uh, my, one of my really best friends and I, we were, um, we were like, well, we're hungry 
And like, we sort of didn't understand the full scope of it. Like it was like a really weird day. Yeah. So we like took bandanas and put them around our mouths. Cause like the dust was crazy and we grabbed our skateboards and we went skateboarding down the middle of Broadway at 4 PM or 5 PM or whenever, like roughly around sunset. And like, we were going down the middle of, of broad, like Broadway, Broadway, yeah. like New York city, Broadway. And I very much remember like the, the light and the like, the, the dust hanging and being like, I really wish I could just take a picture of this. Like that was a really profound moment for me. And like, that was the first time in my head that I was just like, you know what, it would be really cool if I had a camera and I could just remember this. And like that thought sort of stuck in my brain for the next couple of like a year. And then my, my parents helped me buy a camera. Um, and my dad gave me his old film camera and I just fell super hard for it. I was just like, this is amazing. I love this. And like, I was interested in the technical aspect and the social aspect and all of it. And then, um, and also I found, figured out that like, Hey, if I can give magazines words and photos, that makes me more valuable mm. to them. Um, and so I just started doing it and I, I still love it to that. Like I have a film camera that I carry around in my pocket <laughs> all the time. It's my little film camera. That's wow. uh yeah, there you go. Wow. Oh, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh I think my mom still has these. Yeah, and it's it's so funny, like it's it's had a real renaissance. Like these things used to be this thing sold for eighty dollars when it was new and now it's two hundred dollars wow. on the secondary market yeah. if you can find a working one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like Polaroids. Like yeah. Polaroids are expensive. <laughs> so yeah, I do it and um you know, it's, I, I just do it because I really like it. I worked at a photography magazine, you know, like I was freelancing for a lot of general interest pubs, but like my full time was at a photography magazine. And I really thought like, if I don't work, if I don't shoot all the time and I don't really just like live it, then like, why is anybody going to listen to anything that I yeah. say? Mm -hmm. So like, I just started working and shooting like magazine, small, you know, regional magazine jobs, um, local stuff. I shoot a couple weddings every year, which mm -hmm. is like some people get about, but, right. uh, <laughs> you know, I just put it, <laughs> right. You know, like put a kid, I, I mean, if, it's, you know, I know a lot of creatives watch this and like it, it's part-time wedding photographers are like the most hated kind of creative because it's so awesome <laughs> because like I get to hang out, I get to like enjoy this benefit of just picking exactly the clients that I want. Like I've never had a bad wedding. I've never had a bad client because I can pick and choose. And that's usually something that like you have to work for 20 years to get, but yeah. I just yeah. sort of kind of got it immediately. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fun. Like put a, put a camera in my hand. Let's, let's do it. You know, let's whatever it is. Well, your photography story, I mean, rings home rings true to me because I was, I was at SUNY purchase, uh, at nine 11 and I believe it was, uh, Sophomore year. Yeah, me too. And, and yeah, so I was at the school paper at the time and I was sort of flirting with it. I wasn't sure I was going to go into journalism because my family sort of, my, my mom had a history as a reporter. It was felt like the easy fallback and I needed to go to school for something more exciting is what I told myself. And, and then, uh, you know, I was asked to cover it for the school paper. And obviously a lot of folks that purchased were, had family members, you know, and, and sure. it was chaos and panic. And I remember leaving the campus and, you know, just being surrounded by armed personnel carriers and like, what is going on? Right. You know? And, uh, obviously I, we weren't in the city, but you know, that's when it sort of stuck for me that I wanted to yeah, it's you know, like, pursue journalism, but yeah, really profound moments like that, like, yeah. they make a big, a big difference. And like, it, you know, I still think back to it sometimes where it's just like, you know, my, my buddy and I, we haven't done it the past couple of years, but we used to just go to Ben's pizza. Um, which is like, if you ever watched Lucky Louie, it's like the pizza place at the beginning because we were standing there uh, on McDougal Street in New York City and like you could look south and see, you know, the smoke coming up and you could look onto the McDougal Street, which is like this crazy uh, crowded street in New York City. And these hippies had dragged a trampoline into the middle of the intersection and were jumping on it and like we're playing Frisbee and hacky sack in the oh middle of this intersection. And like, we used to go back to that pizza place, like around, you know, you know, not specifically for that, but just, it was like a tradition for a while, but yeah. I'm going to do it again this year, I think. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Make it, make it remember, but. So uh, another aspect of your persona <laughs> or your, your life is, is your connection to music. And, um, yeah. I know you, you, you're connected to the hardcore scene and the, the, punk rock and <laughs> whatever you want to call it. But I'm just wondering how it had an influence on you and what, what you, what your sort of favorite stuff was just given that we can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it was, um, so I was in high school like 96 to 2000, which I think mm -hmm. was sort of a, a golden age for Albany stuff, yep. you know? And like, I wasn't, 
I wasn't like a fixture or anything like that. Yeah. You know, I was I was just the guy who I really liked doing the shows. You know, like if if uh, Down Foundation was playing, I was gonna go. <laughs> uh, you know, and I saw you to see One King Down a bunch of times yep. and Indecision and uh, you know it was just a really it was a really cool time and I think <clears throat> that music and that scene had a very specific lifestyle and I think it was harder to do that back then like now it's really easy to just pick up a lifestyle because you have access to it you yeah. know and there's so much like I was ordering I was like sending checks in the mail to equal vision you know like to get <laughs> <laughs> to get records yep. and like that's a thing that you don't really have to do anymore like I was sending I, I forgot what there was like a big paper catalog too that I remember like sending like having my mom write me a check and then sending it in an envelope and like hoping records came back and they would like six weeks later yep. <laughs> or yeah. something oh, like man. that. Uh, and I, I think that was a very, it was a, it was a lifestyle and I think it was harder to do that back then. I think it's very easy to like fall into a lifestyle now because you can just immerse yourself in things and it's easier to move through them. But like back then I just couldn't get enough of it. And when I, um, like I said, my, my very first, gig was was law of inertia which was like a little indie music magazine and like i was i wrote a cover story about most precious blood like <laughs> I, I wrote a i did like a i had a big picture spread about hope's fall you know like these bands that were so like cool and important for me back then and you know that's really how and then i started working for revolver i did some a bunch of freelance work for them and then you know it sort of transitioned because it came became cool for a while like yeah. i did a profile of um 18 visions for revolver, <laughs> oh, you know, God. like that was the crossover point. And like, uh, I think it was always very, like there was a very DIY ethics about it. And I don't, I don't know. I have very fond memories of all that stuff. And like, I don't go to go to shows that much anymore. I went and saw one King down, you know, oh, cool. yeah. <laughs> when they played around here, I was so excited to be able to go back and do that. Uh, but you know, it was, it felt old and you know, now I go indecision plays once a year and I go to that and, uh, I try to go when I can. I've actually gone to more this year. I went to see Harm's Way at, uh, yeah. that was a fun, that was fun. The, the I, I didn't get there, but I wanted, yeah, that was a show I wanted to see. What is Q. it? It's called the, the Fuse Box now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it's, uh, I, I don't know. I think it formed a lot of my, it, there was a lot of talk about like being strong to your convictions and like, I'm still, whether you label it or not straight edge, like I still don't drink. I still don't smoke or any of that. And that's, you know, just stuck with me for a long time. And that's, mm -hmm. I think that's sort of indicative of like, those people were so creative and cool and and just so so fun. Like I look back on it very fondly. It, it was really important to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too fat and old for it now. But. Uh, yeah, I have the same same problem and <laughs> kids and you don't get to shows. But um, but yeah, I mean it, it does. It, it still sort of haunts Albany in a lot of ways that this once existed and and it informs a lot of the folks who are successful now who came and saw sort of you know, came from that and saw something there. Sure. Cause you can um, draw that straight line from Albany to Syracuse to Buffalo to uh, integrity, <laughs> you know, like you can sort of, there's like that straight line of that, that time frame. you know, like when victory was, was around and, and stuff like that. And I, and I equal vision. Right, sure. Oh, yeah. EVR, of course, of <laughs> course, man. I, I had that, uh, there, I had like an EVR comp that I just played until it, until it died. It had, it had, uh, can we start again by Bane? And then it went right into, uh, whatever that trial song is, which by the way, if you like old hardcore and you're not, you haven't listened to trial, <laughs> that's like, if you come away with one thing, just listen, uh, there's a trial <laughs> LP. This old thing. Yeah. It's called, are these our lives? And it is one of my favorite metalcore albums of all time. It is unbelievably good. Uh, so <laughs> it's my, my musical recommendation Sweet. is to listen to that on the treadmill. So where Perfect. else, where else should people pick up your work? Um, so right now I'm concentrating mostly on my full-time good job because um, we're, we just switched to quarterly. So if you haven't seen an issue of Popular Science in a long time, uh, you should pick one up because uh, we're putting out these, it's like 110 edit pages an issue, wow. which is a ton, a ton of pages. Yeah. And um, we have this, you know, I know I'm biased, but our staff is so absurdly smart and cool and like young, like... Our staff is like 60% just like young female geniuses, <laughs> which is amazing. Like I'm, when I go into the office, it kind of feels like one of those scenarios where like they're the like 
football team ready to play for the championship and I'm like the old wise janitor <laughs> who's just like has all this life experience and is like well you know like that that's how I feel you'll get there <laughs> you know, like they're all literal geniuses um, but the magazine is really cool so I've we've been concentrating on that a lot um, don't mess us up with popular mechanics we don't tell you how to fix your house in our magazine <laughs> it's a lot of uh, I wouldn't understand that anyway. <laughs> yeah um, and then you know I, I've been doing some stuff for Edible, I've been doing, uh, right now I'm working on um, one of the biggest photo editorial projects I've ever done. It's for the next issue of Popular Science. Um, it's uh, it's going to be a really cool story about people who fix things. Um, mm. I can't talk super a lot about it because mm-hmm. it's for the next issue, but I can tell you that I think the plan is to run it as like five or six double trucks in the issue and wow. well. So it is something I'm going to be putting a lot of work into. Uh, double trucks means two page yes. spreads. <laughs> if for, I don't know if everybody. Who <laughs> everyone no, everyone most helps. people don't. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. And then um, also just like I do a lot of local, I've been doing a lot of local business stuff uh, lately for photo photo stuff and for the local EMTs and emergency responders Oh, because uh, my friend Robbie McHugh, who's a really smart guy, um, he might be a good guest for this someday actually because he like helps the local um, EMTs and stuff uh, with their media outreach and with their websites and stuff to like get more social and stuff. And and so I've been taking photos for them and that's been really cool. And like local businesses who just would otherwise have like a Facebook page with smartphone photos, Yeah. Yeah. you know, it's like, that's a bummer. So, you know, it lets me, lets me mess around a little bit. So um, in terms of regular freelancing, I've, I've been toning it down a little bit just to give myself some sanity, you know? And, and uh, so for folks who might want to, be on your list for wedding photography. How, like, who, where, <laughs> should, should they go to your Facebook page? Yeah, or what, do you, no, what do you suggest? You know, it's, uh, I only take roughly 10 a year. Um, if I can, if I think I can manage it and I try not to take too many in this area because like, at least that's my one courtesy to like the full-time guys around here is that I try to like spread mine out. Like, right. I'll do like two Albany, Vermont, Connecticut, mm. Long Island, um, I don't mind poaching from the Long Island guys, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but yeah, you know, at Stan Horacek is me. And then at Stay True Photography is uh, my Instagram for where I'll post wedding stuff. But like, honestly, I don't I don't post a ton because I'm not a, a marketing guy. Yeah. You know, like I'm a, my wife has, you know, on many occasions been like, you know, you could just probably do photography full time. I'm like, yeah, like you, the part of the photography business where you put the camera in my hand and set me loose, I'm a monster. Like I am yeah. not afraid of anything. I'll shoot whatever thing. But you put a piece of paperwork in front of me and I am a, a sack full of old lunch meat who <laughs> cannot manage my own. So that's yeah. that's why it's always been really hard. In terms of like those putting those photo stories together and like going out and shooting and being free to sort of interpret what's happening around you. Um, for other photographers, what would you recommend as like the best way to craft a photo story? Sure. So I, I think one of the things that really helps me is that I'm, I'm a reporter. Like I learned to report. Mm-hmm. And I think some the a thing that I see kind of often is that you get really cool photos, but you don't get enough context with them. And like being able to ask questions because it kind of sucks, right? You just want to go out, take the camera and then shoot the pictures and then be done. But like when you do a big photo essay story, unless you have a writer with you to like get that stuff, you have to like be asking questions and like have a ton of, of audio recordings. And like Mm -hmm. the the hardcore photojournalism guys, they they know that that's just the way of the world. But like, having nice photos isn't enough. And like, you have to just really try and do the reporting and, and give the context. And like, I know that it sucks and it's tedious, but like, you got to send the fact checkers <laughs> something, you know? Yeah. Um, and also I, I think a thing that I, that I see a lot of people doing from a technical standpoint now, and like, feel free to just yak this off if it's like way <laughs> too technical, um, is that people don't think we call it thinking inside and out, right? Where people will be like, well, I stuck my one, my best lens on and I went out and I shot all these photos and they look all nice and they look coherent because they're all shot on the same lens. But what you're lacking is like the exposition. You're lacking these big wide shots, which you really need to help tell the story. And you're lacking these really tight details. You know, you end up like if you have a, a story that's just 12 medium shots, you're like, okay, cool. But at the same time, like I don't, the photos didn't tell me the story. Yeah. Um, that so is, I mean, it, that's absolutely a struggle here that we have with yeah. with various you know folks and when right. you bring people in and you try to 
you try to share that and or do it yourself um but it but it, you know things happen yeah <laughs> people, you just, people come back with right the you same. Just, you, i tell people like okay you found a cool thing to take a picture of just go and take the standard picture of it and now take 10 steps back and take another picture of it and now take five steps forward or 10 steps forward or whatever and then take another picture of it um and like, like that's really how you have to think and i think that's something that's kind of lost because we're not as like uh, as consumers, we're not used to necessarily seeing these series of photographs anymore yeah. because yeah. we s scroll past them one at a time. Yeah. Um, so I think that's like a technical thing that I think people like those two things. Like once you start, once you start thinking about this like inside and out approach, like it helps with both writing and with you know because it's the Definitely. same thing when you write a story. You're like yep. set the scene. And then yeah, we look go around in, the room. Yeah, and then, and then we go to a fine detail, and then we come back out to the point. Yeah, um, and it's the same thing for photos, you know. And like the video guys, and I don't know anything about video. I can shoot very pretty B roll for you, and that is the extent <laughs> of my my video skills. But uh, my understanding is like it's sort of the same thing with mm -hmm. movie editing, where you like mm -hmm. need these, you know, watch a movie, yeah. wide shots, tight shots, yep. mm -hmm. medium shots. Um, so I think that's something people could work on. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no problem. And you know, uh, we we do. Um, if you do follow me on on social, we do. Uh, my daughter and I. I'm trying to like, trying as hard as I can to make her care about photos like I do. So <laughs> we do these like photo walks in the spring and in the summer, where like if people want to come and shoot film, like they can just buy a roll of film off of me and borrow one of my film cameras. Oh wow! Or just like come ask questions. Like we don't. It's not. It's not a paid thing, or it probably should be. I guess, <laughs> but like. You know, we just want to teach people, so yeah, you know, share it. Yeah, we do those because it's just really fun. Very cool. We have a good time. Nice. <laughs> awesome. I would love to come for one of those. Yeah, yeah you should. Yeah, you absolutely should, and it, it's cool. I got to do a thing um, at PopSci this year. I, I bought an old view camera with like the big accordion, mm -hmm. and uh, I bought some direct positive paper, which means you shoot to paper negatives, and then you take them into the dark room and you develop yep. them and I got to like walk some people through that process and they were just like wow this is amazing and I was like oh my god this is my <laughs> I was born like 30 years too early like this should be my I should be like an old man in an apron teaching people how to <laughs> how to work in the dark room that's perfect. yeah unfortunately that's not that's not a job anymore so no, definitely. <laughs> yeah actually my uh, my grandfather was yeah, quite a photographer and essentially his entire dark room is in uh, bags on my uh, in in my basement, so it's it's sad because I want to reassemble it and I'd love to, you know, but it's never going to happen. I'm I that's my winter my summer project. It was my winter project, and then I didn't start on it, so now it's my summer project. <laughs> uh, it's to build my dark room back yeah. up, but I who knows if it'll actually get done. There's a there's a really amazing. Uh, if you watch this now, there's a really amazing Ansel Adams uh, thing going on at the Boston Museum mm -hmm. of Fine Art, and like. Uh, He's amazing, but like one of the most amazing things about him was that in his dark room, he took an old giant camera and made it into his enlarger. And in order to be able to move it back and forth easier, he had them install train tracks in his house, which I think is such a fascinating thing. Oh, that's nuts. Yeah, I, yeah. I saw, I learned that late, recently, and I've just been telling people whether they care <laughs> or not. You're, you're hearing this story because it's amazing, and I love it. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, and, no and we'll hope to talk to you in the future. Yeah, I'm around, man. Happy to happy to do it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Yeah.